In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the capital asset pricing model. And we're going to walk through the equation. Um, we're going to do it twice. The first time, we're going to just do a general overview to give you a sense of what this equation is about. And the second time, we're going to dig um, deep into what these variables mean. So let's get started. We're going to start by looking at the first variable. Um, and this is the return of your investment. And this is what we're trying to solve for. And the key to remember here is that risk and return are related concepts. So you're trying to determine um, what return you should expect to receive to be compensated you for holding this risk. So we're really dealing with risk rates here. The next variable is the risk-free rate. And this is the rate for the most risk-free asset available in the market. So if you go out into the market and you say, I'm going to buy the investment that's the, the most risk-averse investment out there, you'd get some return. Well, that's your benchmark. And then any other opportunity is going to be some premium above that benchmark. So to the risk-free rate, you're going to add the market risk premium. And the market risk premium, premium tells you how much riskier is the market over the risk-free rate. So if you're investing in, say, like a stock market index fund, that's the overall market, how much riskier is that than the, the um, risk-free alternative? But we're not interested in the overall market. We're interested in the individual opportunity. And for that, we're going to look at beta. What's the beta of our investment? And that is comparing the variability of your individual opportunity versus the overall market. So if we're looking at stocks, we're going to say, all right, my company, the stock of my company has a variability that's going to be greater than the market or less than the market. So if it was the same as the market, you'd get a beta of one. And that means you expect it to follow the market or be similar to a market index fund. If it's riskier than the market, you'd expect a beta higher than one. And this means it would fluctuate greater than the market. A beta, beta less than one means it'd be less variable than the market. So in this equation, we're starting with the risk-free rate. We're adding the market risk premium, which we're multiplying by the beta of your investment. And this tells us, this will tell us how much we should be compensated for the risk we're holding for this individual investment. So why do we calculate risk this way? And I got to say, I think this equation is genius. This is a genius equation because what it does is it acknowledges that the financial world is interrelated. So we're not just taking our individual investment opportunity and considering it by itself and saying, this is how risky the investment is. It's comparing the riskiness of your investment versus the market, which is compared to the risk-free rate. So you're saying it's all interrelated. And the reason why this is important is, let's say you've invested in a stock. And let's say the overall stock market does really well this year. Well, um, if you have a riskier investment than the market, you should expect an even greater variability than the market. So you should, for holding that risk, you should have achieved a higher return than the market. If you didn't, you need to look at that investment because you might not be compensated for the risk that you took on. And the reason why that is is because, you know, the market generally does well in times of economic prosperity good economies. And good economies lead to better profits for businesses. That leads to higher stock prices. So in this time of this good economic time, why didn't the company's stock for your individual investment perform accordingly? So it's, it's acknowledging that everything is interrelated in this economic sense. So let's go back through the equation again and really look at these variables. And what I want you to understand is the assumptions we're making here, because we're making some pretty significant assumptions. 
So starting with the risk-free rate. With the risk-free rate, it's an interesting question. What's the actual rate that we plug in here to this equation? So most people take guidance by looking at the U.S. Treasury. They consider that the least risky alternative out there. But even if you, just, you, even if you use that assumption, the U.S. Treasury is a market that's fluctuated over time. So, you know, in this range of numbers, what's the actual number that you use? Not only that, what we're really wanting here is we're wanting the future risk-free rate. So we're going to sit here and do this historical analysis, but we're going to use that to inform our decision of where we think risk-free rates will be in the future. And that's a huge assumption. Next is the market risk premium. And here again, you have the same issue. You know, you can do an analysis and look at market rates over time, but history is no guarantee of what's going to happen in the future. You have to make a judgment call uh, to say what I think the market risk premium will be in the future. And that's an assumption. But that's not the only assumption we're making here. The other big assumption is just deciding what the market is. Are we going to use as the market just the individual sector? Are we going to use the overall stock market? Um, are we going to use the, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the Dow, U.S. stocks, uh, world stocks? So there's a lot of assumptions that are made in just uh, determining the market. And then you have beta. Now beta is, is a whole lot of assumptions by itself. So we said that beta is the variability from the individual stock opportunity versus the market. Well, we calculate that out using a regression analysis. And a regression analysis is you take two columns of numbers. In one column you have the daily changes in stock price for the individual stock. And in the second column you have the daily changes in stock price for the market. And then you can compare the two and you can say statistically what is the variability? And that if for greater variability greater than the market, it's higher than one. Lower than the market, it's less than one. Well, <laughs> you know, we have the problem again of hist history versus the future. You need to take your beta and then make a determination, is my beta going to be sa the same in the future? But not only that, we're making an assumption based on what period of time we're looking at. Are we going back and looking at stock prices over the last five years, over the last 25 years? It makes a difference. And it's interesting, if you go to different financial websites, you'll get different results for beta um, for the same stock. And it's because people are using slightly different assumptions. And they're generally pretty close. Um, but it's important to realize what assumptions you're making when you're using this formula. So you might be asking, <laughs> if there's so many assumptions, how is this even useful? And what happens in a practical sense is you sit down and you do a lot of analysis. You do a lot of hard work going through mountains of data and you start to get a sense of your market and you start to get a sense of what are reasonable values that I can plug in here. So I'd like to do an example where we're actually plugging in values into the equation. So I'm going to use some numbers and these are just hypothetical numbers. For the risk-free rate we're going to use 4%. For the market risk premium we'll use 8% and for beta we'll use 2. So starting with the risk-free rate of 4%. So our risk-free alternative, our benchmark, would be uh, would, we should expect a return of 4%. When we add the market risk premium, that's 8 plus 4 equals 12. So an investment in the market index, should return. we should expect a return of 12%. Now when we multiply by the beta, which is 2, we get 16 plus 4 equals a return of 20%. So that's pretty high. That's a pretty risky investment. Um, but we should be expecting a pretty high return to be compensated for holding that risk. 
So if we invested $100 in this risk at 20%, we should be expecting a return of 120. So I'd like to take a step back and think about what we're accomplishing here with the capital asset pricing model. What's going on? Um, this is really a process. And, you know, we are in the process of making a financial decision. It might be a business decision. It might be an investment decision. Um, but we're making some decision about some assumption we have about a future opportunity. And that future cash flow, we're going to discount by some assessment of the risk involved. And we can get this understanding of the risk involved by using some process like the capital asset pricing model and comparing the risk of this individual opportunity versus the riskiness of the market compared to the risk-free rate. So as a business person, the better you can get at going through this process and being really thoughtful about your assumptions, the better your financial outcomes will be.